good afternoon to all of you on my own behalf also i welcome you all to this special sessions on raj yoga meditation the topic of today's discussion is stress free living there are two basic concept of keeping away from stress one is concept of stress management another is concept of stress free living now let us try to understand what is the basic difference between these two the concept of stress management means due to one or more reasons when we come on under stress then manage it by adopting any one or more techniques of stress management now these techniques may be physical techniques intellectual techniques psychological technique yogic techniques any sort of technique we adopt some relaxation techniques are also there adopt those relax uh, techniques and just uh, manage your stress this is one concept now there is another concept of stress free living now here whatever may be the situation or circumstances one does not come under the stress at all as one has developed enough strength ability and resilience to cope up with pressures challenges and competition whatever competition challenges or pressure he is facing but he will not come under the stress because he has enough strength and resilience so there is no question of stress management at all he has not to do anything for the stress management because he doesn't come under the stress at all so these are the basic two concepts of course we are going to discuss both the things uh, we will be discuss- discussing on some physical intellectual psychological and yogic techniques of stress management but our more emphasis will be on stress relieving that how to lead a stress free life and there comes the raj yoga meditation the raj yoga meditation is a technique where we can develop all this inner strength abilities and resilience which is needed for uh, facing this pressures challenges and competitions so our more emphasis will be on stress free living rather than stress management but still however you know you may be interested in learning those techniques also so we'll be discussing all those techniques also so here before we go to the uh, how to lead a stress free life let let us try to understand that why is it necessary for us to discuss this particular topic now now you can see that the stress and anxiety day by day it is increasing all over the world generally the t- children and the elderly persons or a retired person should not have stress because there is no reason for the stress for them but still have we see that even the school going children and even the retired persons they have their own problems and they are also under the stress so no one is spared from the stress now one of the, one philosopher investigated the last four centuries and he gave his opinion about this four century he said that the 17th century has been described as the age of faith 18th century considered as age of reasoning 19th century was age of progress and for the 20th century what he said that is important for us and that is the age of stress he said that in the 17th century people does not have that much of uh, reasoning power or the cognitive powers that much developed and therefore at that time whatever a political leaders or religious leader told the people they blindly follow them because that themselves does not have enough reasoning power now here there was a lot of exploitation of the people and then people started understanding and then they developed a so the whole 17th century was the age of faith 18th century people started reasoning and some cognitive powers were developed in the people and there that is why 18th century was century of reasoning and naturally when the reasoning power is developed 
uh, comprehension power is also developed. Certain cognitive powers are also developed. That will be a progress. So 19th century he described as the age of progress. And we see also that in 19th century there was a lot of progress. Uh, most of the scientists, especially in uh, engineering and technology side. So far as the applied science is concerned, the progress was in the 19th century. Uh, and then afterwards came the 20th century. Here he said that whosoever took birth in the 20th century and lived in the 20th century, they all lived with stress and anxiety. And he described the whole century as the century of stress and anxiety. And therefore, and he also predicted for the 21st century also. Now he predicted that if this particular stress is not managed, what will happen? He says that, and that is why it is of utmost importance to manage this particular stress. If this, this particular stress and anxiety is not managed, then 21st century in which we already entered and already 20, this is the 22nd year of the 21st century, that he said that it will be the age of panic. You know, he has used the word panic. And he said that God has given a wisdom to the human being. And all of a sudden, a human being will get awakened and it can be the age of peace. So he also said that it all depends upon us. We have to decide that whether we want it to be a age of panic or whether the 21st century we want it to be a age of peace. It we have to do it's in our hand. So certainly if I ask you, you are all sitting. If I ask you, what would you prefer? Would you like it to be age of panic or would you like it to be age of peace? Naturally, the answer will be what? Certainly, please, everyone will say that yes, we want the age of peace. Then, most important priority of the 21st century has to be stress management. And this stress has to be managed. And if it is not managed, what will happen to the future generation? We can't say anything, correct? And so, if we want to keep away from the panic of the 21st century, Anyway, we have to manage this stress and we have to get rid of it. Now, there are certain misconceptions about the stress. So I want to begin this particular topic with this. There are a lot of misconceptions, but mainly the four misconceptions I have discussed here. The, the very first misconception is there. Most people think that stress is a part of everyday life because we see stress and anxiety everywhere. And therefore, we accepted the stress. Most of the people think that the stress is a part of everyday life. Life without stress is not possible. Believing this, they do not think anything about the stress management. And finally, they suffer from adverse effects of stress on the body, mind, emotions, and behavior. So this is the first misconception that the stress is a part of life. Our ancestors were not living with uh, this type of stress at all. And therefore, stress is not a part of life. We have, a we have made it a part of life. Now, we should keep away from that. Second, jogging, relaxation, yoga, sun, doing pranayam like activities can make us stress free. But this belief is also misleading, you know. These actions may provide some relief from stress, but it cannot make us stress free. This is important to understand. So this, this is mostly people do this and this is a misconception and that way we cannot manage the uh, stress. Third misconception is this. Some believe that the stress is necessary to get ahead in the life. It increases a person's work speed and efficiency. This is what believe. And lit, little bit they are correct also. We'll see this in the stress curve also. But this belief is also misleading. Attention is needed, not tension, to increase efficiency and the speed of the work. You have to be 
attentive, not pensive. So we have to differentiate between attention and tension also. So here I have shown the stress curve. So it is it is right that when there is a zero stress, then we have some optimum performance level. But as the stress goes on increasing, our performance levels gradually go up, little bit go up. And then a point come, a threshold come, and beyond that, if the stress is increasing, then the whole curve drops. You know, then the performance level goes down. Our efficiency goes down, and therefore, uh, this particular range of the stress is sometimes called use stress, use stress, useful stress, and the remaining part that where there is a drop, drastic drop, uh, that part is called the uh, distress. So there are two types of stress. One is a useful stress, use stress, and another is distress. But what I mean to say that stress is always a stress. You you are always affected by the stress. You are not by this useful stress even. Uh, your mind is affected. Your emotions are affected. Uh, your body is also affected. So we are not free from the uh, negative effect of. So we are paying some cost. My point is that that you are that naturally you are increasing your efficiency, but you are paying some cost. So stress is a stress. So this is a misunderstanding that uh, if you remain under the stress, then your efficiency and work speed increases. But you are paying a very heavy cost. And the last one, most people believe this is a very important one to understand. Most people believe that situation, event, other persons or pers person are responsible for their stress. Mostly we believe because whenever we ask anyone who is under the stress that what is the reason of your stress, what is the cause of stress, then he always describes some situation, some circumstance uh, which he is facing. Or he will be telling that this and that person uh, is responsible for my stress. So mostly we are, uh, the global problems and the odd situations create stress in the person. But this is the biggest misconception about stress. In fact, a person's negative attitude towards the situation, event, or persons, as well as lack of his inner strength or lack of ability to cope up with the situation is responsible for his stress. Not the circumstance or a situation. So on the with this misconception, let us try to understand what exactly the stress is. How the people or psychologists have tried to define the stress. So some of the definitions of the stress, popular definition of the stress, we will go through. So this will make it make it very clear that what exactly the stress is and what is the true concept of the stress. The very first definition given by one person, the result of a person, what is stress? Stress is the result of the person being pushed beyond the limit of his normal ability. So everyone has limit of some abilities. So by this may be by situation or circumstance. When a person is pushed beyond the limit of his normal ability, then the mental state which is developed that is called the stress. This is one of the definitions. Another definition, very clearly here it is very clearly mentioned that the circumstances or the situations or event, they are not responsible for your stress. So stress is not an event or a circumstance, but it is a response to the human limitations. It is your limitations that you come under the stress. The third definition is also very similar. Stress is our inability to cope up with the change around us because we are living in the changing environment and there is a continuous, uh, this environment, a continuous environment is changing. And when we are not able to uh, accommodate or adjust ourselves with the changing environment, then the mental state which is developed is called the stress. Now this this is little bit elaborated. Same definition is there, but little bit more elaborated. 
whenever there is a change in environment now this change in environment may be a physical psychological may be social or may be economical even may be political which we appraise as damaging no one may everyone may not appraise as damaging but those who appraise it as damaging or harmful then some demand is placed on us for the adjustment some sort of adjustment we have to make the way our body and mind respond to this demand is called stress so one of the person has given this definition now the next one uh, this is uh, this is more clear little bit more clear actually the term stress and strain that that, that comes from physics in physics also whenever any body is subjected to external forces then the stress is developed within the body so here there the stress is equal to the pressure or the force which is coming on the body divided by the resilience to the resilience of the body so this particular quotient this ratio is called the stress so similarly at this particular mental stress as an analogy with the physical stress which is developed in the object or a body so here similarly the mental stress can be also defined in a form of a ratio or in a form of a quotient in the numerator you can see what is in the numerator external pressure challenges and competitions and in the denominator there is a inner strength and ability now if this ratio is 1 when this ratio will be 1 then inner strength and ability is equivalent to external pressure challenges and competition then this ratio will be 1 what does it mean that if the ratio is 1 then there is no reason for stress because you have enough inner strength and ability and resilience to face the external pressure challenges and competitions but if this ratio and even if the ratio is let us say more than rather less than 1 when it will be less than 1 when the denominator is greater than the numerator that means you have a more than enough inner strength and ability to cope up with the external pressure challenges and competitions in that this case the ratio will be less than 1 so if the ratio is less than 1 or equal to 1 there is no reason for the stress there is no stress at all but if the ratio goes beyond 1 then what happens naturally you will be under stress because you do not have inner enough inner strength and ability or resilience to cope up with the external pressure challenges and competitions which you are facing so stress is anything now a simple lemon definition if, if i want to give stress is anything internal or external that has a harmful effect on mind and body now in medical science also people have tried to define the stress in medical terminology and especially the sensile he is considered to be the founding father of the stress research what he says about the stress let us see any external stimulus which leads to the physiological changes in the form of three changes are there one is enlargement of the lymph node stimulation of corticosteroids and increase in muscle tension can be considered as a stress so if you have this sign developed in the physical body then you can say yes the person is in under the stress what are those three signs one is the enlargement of the lymph nodes all of you know that god has given us the immune system in our body now basically there are three systems for controlling our functions of the body and that is one is the for the safety of the body we have a immune system endocrine system central nervous system also now here in the immune system there is a complete network from top to bottom of our body and there are certain uh, at certain junction of this particular immune system network there are some lymph nodes and these particular lymph nodes are affected most by the stress 
and they get enlarged. So if there is enlargement of the lymph nodes, it indicates that there is a stress. Similarly, you know that stimulation of cortical, particularly cortical stress, actually due to the stress, our hormonal imbalance uh, all over the body is created. There are a number of uh, endocrine glands on, in our physical body secreting different types of hormones. And with these hormones, different functions are managed in the physical body. So particularly in the adrenal gland, which is located in the cortex of the kidney, uh, this uh, secretions uh, of the cortical steroid increases. Increase in the muscles tension can be also considered as a stress. So if these three signs are developed in the physical body, then uh, we can say that a person is under the stress. So these are some of the uh, definitions of the uh, stress. So here also it becomes very, very clear that all the time we should not blame situation, circumstance or the event uh, for our stress. A lack of our inner strength, lack of our ability, lack of resilience, tolerance, and so many, so many other factors are there uh, that creates particularly our negative attitudes that creates the stress. Now, uh, this is also important to understand because, and when we understand it, that what are the negative effects of the stress, which are called the signs also, uh, medical uh, terminology, it is also called the sign of the stress. So there are physical, uh, body is also affected, our emotions are also affected. Mental effects are also there. Our behavior is also affected. So let us try to understand that what are this particular negative effect so that we can be serious about the stress management. That yes, we have to manage the stress. So here the first, these are the general things are shown here. First of all, effect of stress on the body is disastrous. First of all, it is such a disaster, and therefore the number of diseases, most of the diseases are called psychosomatic. Diabetes, lifestyle disorder, particularly diabetes and blood pressure and the heart problems and so many other diseases, which are called lifestyle disorders. This lifestyle illnesses, they are due to this particular stress and anxiety. So effect of the stress on the body is disastrous. Effects deeply on hypothalamus and pituitary glands. Therefore, affects autonomic nervous system and endocrine system. Because our endocrine system is controlling a number of voluntary and involuntary functions of our body. And pituitary gland ultimately control because it is a king gland controlling the endocrine system. Thalamus and hypothalamus. Thalamus is also there and hypothalamus is also there. These are the two, two organs which controls our central nervous system as well as the autonomic nervous system also. And therefore, due to the stress, first of all, this pituitary gland and hypothalamus is affected. And this hypothalamus also is secreting around nine, more than nine hormones, important hormones. And pituitary gland also secretes a lot of hormones. And our body is uh, controlled by these particular hormones. So it also affects our immune system. As I told you that there is enlargement of the lymph nodes and lipid metabolism uh, is also affected because of that the, there can be heart problems and the neuron salt. The neurons are the cells of the brain. They are also affected. In another, if you don't want to give in all details, in the layman language, all the 75 trillions in our physical body, there are 75 trillions of body cells. And all these 75 trillions of our body cells are affected by our thoughts, you know. So if, if stress means negative thoughts are there, wasteful thoughts are there, and therefore uh, all 75 trillions of the cell will be affected. Now, let us see some physical effect. What are the those physical effects? If these things are there, then we may say that uh, one is suffering from the stress. Headache, infections, pro throbbing heart, allergies, 
इंडाइजेशन नौसिया टेट वेट लॉस और गेन वेग एक एंड पेन्स एंड इंसोमिया एंड देट कैन बी मनी मोर ऑल्सो and these are some of the important i have listed here and i think i don't need any discussion here uh, we, it is understood so uh, if you have a headache or now and then uh, if, if if you if you are suffering from infections and if you have a heart problems then stress may be the reason but in other words if you are suffering from any of these things at least you should keep away from the stress you know for the remedy also you're curing that also one should try to keep away from the stress okay so these are some physical effect and we should keep away from that these are some of the mental effect i won't discuss in detail because we lack of time but i have just listed here you can go through indecisive hasty decision both ways either we remain indecisive under the stress or we make hasty decision and hasty decision possibly it can be a wrong decision also so indecisive hasty decisions now and then we may make mistakes if you are under stress forgetfulness lack of concentration this is very important he will not he will not be able to a stressful person will not be able to focus his mind and he cannot work also that efficiently easily distracted worry more mood swing he will be moody moody and mood swing will be there so these are some of the there can be many more also but these are the main mental effect of the stress and anxiety on the human being and here the effect on emotions there are certain effects the irritable anger alienation nervousness apprehensive we becomes apprehensive cynicism cynicism finding fault with others loss of confidence job or life dissatisfaction in another words overall this indicate low value of emotional quotient or low value of emotional intelligence so if you want to keep away from all this we have to keep away from the stress and effect on behavior poor management naturally he will not be able to manage properly either at home or at the office poor interpersonal relation his relations with other a stressful person uh, relations with others will be also uh, poor he is always restless loss or gain of appetite drink smoke more takes work at home because he is not able to complete it at, at the office too busy to relax unsociable so these are some of the effect on behavior let us causes of stress you know sometimes when we know the cause and if the cause is eliminated then we can be free from stress so it is important to know for us that what are the causes of the stress so there are there can be many causes but what is the root cause the very root cause i will discuss first and then general causes will be discussing afterwards the basic root cause for the development of the stress is this most of the stress is are symbolic and very few are real mostly they are symbolic the situation circumstances event or the people are not responsible for our stress we have discussed this several times before but the view point with which we look at the situation is a real cause of the stress with what view point we evaluate the situation with what view point we look at the situation that is the real cause of the stress if our view point is positive if the attitude is positive then no stress will be developed but when we evaluate with negative look out then definitely the stress is going to be there second point it is our attitude which builds up the state of our mind if you want to change the world change your attitude 
this is the saying of Deepak Chopra. You must have heard the word of Deepak Chopra. Uh, probably K is missing here. It is a Deepak Chopra. And you must have heard he is a management guru. He is considered to be management guru in USA. And uh, probably he was a consultant of one president also. So he says that if you want to change the world, change your attitude. But simply by changing the attitude, you can change everything. Like another person, late William James, founding father of psychology, he also said the greatest discovery of 20th century is that by changing your attitudes, you can change your perception. And if you change your perception, then there won't be any reason for the stress at all. So let us be positive. Let, let us make our attitude positive. Let us try to evaluate every situation or circumstances positively. So if this type of attitude is developed, then we can be we can keep away from the stress. So this is the general cause. Now the minor a common man come when common men come under the stress, who doesn't have enough strength and abilities and all these things. Even the perceptions are also not clear attitude are not positive, then in such situation, uh, he can come under the stress. So first of all, physical causes, excessive heat or cold, excessive noise. And today, noise pollution is a great problem. And because of this, lot of people come under the stress, you know, excessive noise. This is not a ordinary cause, but so many people, you know, they remain under stress because of the noise pollution. A lot of noise is there. Noise pollution, it is called, and because of that also, people are under stress. So excessive heat or cold, excessive noise, person's own illness. Whenever we go ill, we come under tension. Excessive physical work. Some people have to work excessively, physical work. In that case also, they come under stress. And that is why sometimes they become addict also. There are certain family causes, you know, different lifestyles, family members, different lifestyle, different uh, values, sharing of the workload problems. You know, if, uh, if, if, if there is a combined family, even husband and wife is there with the children. And when both are uh, doing job or both are working, in that case, uh, sharing of workload becomes very important. And if the sharing of workload is not proper, uh, there can be a clash, uh, conflict, and uh, there can be a stress because of that also. Even uh, so, this is very, very important. Everyone has to, every member has to understand, and they contribute uh, to the uh, work of the family. Financial difficulties, you know, and uh, this financial difficulty is also a great reason for uh, the stress and anxiety. Distribution of money and assets. There are many problems amongst the brother and family problems are also there. Distribution of money and assets. I can give all different examples, but I think because of the uh, short of time, we won't, have, won't be able to discuss in detail. Illness or death of a family member. Now, the, mostly the psychologists working on the stress management, they say they have identified 100 situations, 100 situations where, where a common man, a normal man will come under the stress when he is facing this 100 situation. Now, the highest stress is developed when there is a death of nearest and dearest. When there is a death of nearest and dearest, then highest stress is developed. What is what they say? What the psychologist said. So illness or the death of the family member that also caused the stress. Then staying away from the family. Many at times the situations occur where we have to keep uh, away from the uh, family. And whenever if one is uh, doing job, and if the job is transferable, so now and then transfer takes place. So in the beginning, of course, when the children are quite young, at that time. Uh, the whole family moves from here to there. But after some time, you know, 
uh, when the uh, children becomes uh, at least the teenagers, then it's difficult, difficult to move. So at that time, the person will have to stay alone. You know, family will settle at, at one particular place and uh, the man will uh, keep on moving from one place to another place. So staying away from family, uh, that can also cause a lot of uh, stress. So these are some of the, there can be many more family causes, but the main family causes for the development of the stress I have listed here. Then career and job oriented causes. These are the many because mostly uh, so far as these particular uh, countries are concerned, where you are there, uh, mostly everyone has to work. Everyone has to work. Unemployment, lack of job security. Job is there, but it is not as secured. Anyone, one can get layoff. So lack of job security, lack of clear goals of the life. Still not found one snick. That means snick means goal. Their goal is there that yes, my final destination is there. My goal is this, but still not found the nick or goal. Promotion. Promotion is due, but not getting. So naturally, person will be there will be some anxiety and may, may remain in uh, tension. Too much or too little work load. Now, too much of work definitely that will cause the stress, but too little work can also cause uh, a stress. And there we have sometimes it was happening with me, you know, when I was working. So many times I was in the uh, educational institution when the students were giving, go, going on strike. Then, you know, we were all free. So, what to do? The students are not there. What to teach? What not to teach? At that time, I was, uh, I took some more responsibility uh, in the institution. So, anyway, I was remaining busy. So too much of work or too little work, too little work also can cause uh, a lot of stress. Poor physical condition of the workplace, you know. Here, of course, in, in the developed countries like uh, Canada or USA, this problem may not be there. But particularly in India, the workplace is so dirty and untidy. Uh, people will not be able to work properly. So the poor physical condition of the workplace, time, pressure, and deadlines. Time pressure is that because if you have not learned time management, or if you are not utilizing your time properly, and if you are not keeping deadlines of your uh, goals, then also a lot of uh, uh, this uh, stress can be developed because the work is to be complete, to completed and it is not yet done. Conflict with colleagues, subordinates, and bosses. Conflict, conflict with colleagues, so subordinates and bosses. You, you might have experienced this. So I don't go in detail of this. Nah, then there are certain social causes also. Spoiled relationship with family members, friends, neighbors, and colleagues. And this particular this spoiled relation will create a lot of conflict and we have to manage this conflict. Different values, expectations, obligations, poor communication. So here you have to learn this communication skill also and time management. Both are important for stress-free living in the end. Therefore, generally in HRD, uh, this human resources development uh, rather, uh, these two topics are very important. One is the uh, communication skill, another is the time management. So, if you learn this too, you can be stress free. Misunderstanding, jealousy. So, these are some, some of the social causes which can create a lot of stress. Now, overall, the whole globe is facing a lot of, whole world is facing a lot of problems. You can see that there are a number of problems and those global problems also create, uh, we may not have a personal problem, but certain global problems are responsible 
for sometimes become responsible for our uh, stress and anxiety. So here I have simply listed out some of the uh, global problems and uh, how to minimize these global problems or how, how we can we should develop our own self so that this particular global problem does not affect us much. So one is economical global problem. Inflation is there. Unemployment is there. Poverty is there. Depression is there. Depreciation is there. Then there are certain social problems also. Broken families, bitter relationship, selfishness, evil customs, you know. Then political, political anarchy we see uh, nowadays in different countries, instability of the government, particularly strife, corruptions. Then there are certain moral and ethical problems also. Generally, if we generation by generation, there is a erosion of the ethical and the moral values. So lack of ethical values, downgrading, influence of vices. So these are some of the global problems. And because of these particular global problems, uh, we person come under the stress. So this way we have seen that there can be many reasons for the development of the stress and anxiety. But if you have enough strength, ability and resilience to cope up with this all situations, then there won't be any reason for your stress. Now let us try to now our main topic that how to lead a stress free life or how to manage a stress. Due to any reason, once we come under the stress, how can it be managed? So as I told you, there are two concepts. One is the stress management. Another is a, to learn how to lead a stress free life. So, so far as the stress management is concerned, I told you that there are many uh, relaxation techniques. There are many uh, physical techniques, intellectual techniques, psychological techniques, as well as the yogic technique also. So we will begin with some of the physical techniques. So, so far as the physical technique is concerned, today I will just demonstrate uh, before you one relaxation technique. So, due to one or more reason, or whenever you come under the stress, you just practice this for three to five minutes. Then you'll be relieved from the stress temporarily, you know. And uh, it, it doesn't assure you that when this Again, when you face the same situation, you won't come under the stress. Because here, due to this particular technique, our perceptions are not changing. It is not yet your inner strength and resiliency is increasing. This is simple, simply a relaxation technique temporarily for the short time or for that instant, you will be relieved from the stress. And again, you will be able to focus your mind. So this technique is scientific one and can be useful also. So we will begin with that particular technique and I will demonstrate you. We will all uh, together will practice this particular technique. Now this particular relaxation technique is important even for Rajog meditation also because Rajog meditation is a science of uh, introversion and introspection. So to be introvert and to introspect the self we need to focus our mind. We have to stabilize our mind. We have to focus our mind. We have to achieve some sort of concentration so that we can move ahead for Rajyog meditation practice. So both way, this particular technique will relieve you from uh, stress and anxiety for a short time. At the same time, you can easily achieve your concentration. And even when you are working at your workplace, in the office or some important work uh, where you need a high level of concentration, then you can practice this method for two, three minutes and then begin your work. So that way also uh, it will help you. Now let us try to understand this. Here simply you have to breathe deeply. Breathe in and breathe out. Simple. It is not a pranayam sort of thing. It is a deep breathing technique. Simple deep breathing technique. 
Now you see our rate of respiration is around 25, 22 to 26 uh, respiration per minute. Per minute we take 25 breaths. Now this is too high, you know, it is not a normal. The normal rate of our ancestors were not breathing so deeply. But in this particular generation, the rate of generation rather of the thought is also uh, uh, increased. At the same time, the rate of respiration has also gone up. Now this rate of respiration and the rate of generation of thought, they have a correlation. So you can see that when we are excited, when we are excited too much, and that at that time the rate of respiration automatically goes. And sometimes you know, when we sit silently, fully relaxed, you see your rate of respiration. Your rate of respiration will go down. So the rate of generation of thought or the state of the mind and the rate of respiration has a relationship. So why not to utilize these relationships for stabilizing the mind. So with our own effort, we can control our rate of breathing. We can bring down our rate of respiration by breathing deeply. If you deeply breathe, naturally the rate of respiration will go down. And when the rate of respiration goes down, you may not be able to change the quality of the thought, but the rate, the quantity of the thoughts or the rate at which the thoughts are generated in the mind can very easily be controlled. So when the rate of generation of the thought goes down, then you feel a lot of relaxations. You know. So fast thinking, in fast thinking, and that also wasteful thinking, there is a lot of depletion of the energy, and that creates a lot of tiredness in our physical body. And that way, that is why also this particular the physical technique of deep breathing will be quite helpful to us. Now here, what we have to do, I will describe the method. We have to bring down our rate of respiration from, which I told you around 20 to 25, to around 12 to 15. We have to breathe deeply so that the rate of respiration goes down to 12 to 15. That means 12 to 15 breaths per minute we have to take. And for that, one particular cycle, one breath, we will get five seconds, around five seconds, 4.5 to five seconds we will get. Now in this five second, in one particular breathing cycle, four operations are generally carried out, four operations. One is inspiration, that means we inhale, and then for a fraction of a second or for a short time, we hold the air in our lungs so that there is a proper exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen, and then we exhale gradually and then we take little rest and again begin the second breath so there are four operations if i want to talk in terminology of the pranayam and then the first is inhalation or inspiration that is known as the purakriya in terminology of the pranayam and then the time for which you are holding in your lungs that breath you are holding in the lungs that is known as Antar Kumbhak. And then we are next, we are exhaling or expiration that is known as a Rechak or Rechan. And then we are taking a rest for a fraction of second and then begin the next breath. So this rest period is known as the Bhaya Kumbhak. So these are the four operations. Now, here in this four operations that we have to complete in five seconds. So the breakup is very, very important. Now, the, there are different opinions for this particular uh, time and different institutions, they have given different times, time breakup. But the time breakup which I am suggesting you is suggested by Dr. Ornish. And Dr. Ornish was the world best cardiologist in decade of 60, around 1965, he was uh, doing this bypass surgery. And afterwards, he went to India and he learned this yogic technique and he developed this uh, abdominal deep breathing technique and he gave the time breakup which I am suggesting you. So for second and a half, we have to inhale. Listen carefully because we have to do it. For a second and a half, we have to inhale 
for a half a second or three quarter of a second, we have to hold our breath in our lungs. Then subsequent to second, gradually we have to exhale and then we have to take rest for half a second or three quarter of a second. And with this, the total, if you make, it will come out to be 4.5 to 5 seconds. The rhythm will, the rhythm will automatically set and it will come down to 12 to 15 breaths per minute. So this time break pop is easy also. It is not strenuous. You know, different people have suggested different. Sometimes the inspiration is faster than the uh, expiration. Sometimes the expiration is faster than the inspiration. Uh, variations are there. But this time period for a common man, or for, for a man like us, this is easy to do also. So I am repeating for second and a half, we have to inhale for half a second, for three quarter of the second, we have to exhale and rather, rather hold the air and then subsequent two seconds, we have to exhale and then we have to take rest for half a second or three quarter of a second. So this way we will keep on uh, uh, repeating the cycle of our breathing. Now this is, this is the, uh, this is called abdominal breathing also. You know, our breathing is also not natural. Generally, we uh, when as we keep on uh, growing, uh, we generally breathe with the uh, chest. Actually, we should breathe with the abdomen. That is a, a normal breathing, healthy breathing also. So when you inhale, your belly should gradually, steadily come out. Correct. It doesn't mean that you have to blow your belly, but without straining, when you inhale, let your belly gradually, steadily come out. And when you exhale, let your belly gradually, steadily go inward. So this is, and that is why it is called abdominal breathing. Now in abdominal breathing, the advantage of abdominal breathing is that, that you can hold more amount of air in the lungs. Because in the abdominal breathing, there is a longitudinal expansion of the lungs rather than the lateral one. The lateral expansion is limited because the lung is situated in the cage of a rib. And that is why the lateral expansion, there are restrictions in the lateral expansion. But so far as the longitudinal expansion is concerned, uh, uh, it can be uh, increased also. So with the abdominal breathing, uh, you can hold more amount of air in the lungs. And this is the, and that is why abdominal breathing is always healthy, you know. Uh, so with this, now another thing that this particular technique is important because here you can verify whether your mind is focused or not, whether you have achieved that mindful state or not. Verification is there. And here also you achieve some sort of concentration. Once the rhythm is set, what we have to do? We have to withdraw our mind from all the subjects and objects. And we have to simply focus our mind uh, on the breathing. We have to observe our breathing with full trusteeship. So here withdrawal of the mind will be also there. At the same time, you are focusing on some physical process. That is not that difficult. Focusing on the process or focusing on the object. It becomes simple. Suppose if you take a candle light and if someone says that you focus for some time on this particular flame of the candle light, then it becomes easy for us to do that. And many people are using uh, with, uh, uh, this particular practice for achieving concentration also. But here uh, we are going to withdraw our mind from all the sides, from all the subjects, from all the objects, and we are just going to focus on our breathing and we will, with trusteeship, we will observe our breathing. When we do this, what will happen? You have a two experience and we are going to have this two experience and everyone has to do this two experience. What are those two experiences? During inspiration or during inhalation, there is the inward flow of the air through the nostril or on the upper lip. And during exhalation, there is an outward flow of the air or our breathing. So this inward and outward flow during inspiration, expiration, that we have to sense 
on the inner walls of our nostril. And if you are able to sense this inward and outward flow on your inner walls of your nostril, it means that your mind is fully focused. If your mind is not focused, if it is moving somewhere else, then you won't have this experience. And this, this is this this way we can verify also that whether my mind is focused or not. Another experience, you know, the, during inspiration, there is a fresh air going in, and during expiration, a warm air, warm air is coming out. So, the fresh air which is going in is cold comparatively, and air which we are exhaling, the breath which we are exhaling, that is a warm. So we have to sense this coldness of the air during inspiration and warmness of the air during expiration. So if you are able to experience, if you are able to sense that coldness of the air during inspiration and warmness of the air during expiration, you can believe, yes, my mind is fully stable, fully concentrated, and I have achieved a mindful state. And once you achieve this mindful state, then you can begin your Rajog meditation or you can just focus uh, your mind on your file. Yeah? When you, if you are working in office, when you sit on the table, uh, when you begin your work, do this for three, five minutes and see the change, you know, because when you, when you from, from a family, you are going to the office. So naturally some thoughts will be there on the mind regarding the family. And then you have to change. So this particular uh, technique is very useful for diverting and focusing the mind. So of course we are going to use for Raju meditation this technique. So let us uh, practice this. I have described in detail. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, still, however, during our practice, I'll give you directions also. So wherever all of you are sitting, wherever you are sitting, and uh, so you sit comfortably. Mostly all of you are sitting on the chair or you are sitting on the sofa, wherever you may be. But you have to sit comfortably, all of you. Sit comfortably. Relax your body. All the limbs you have to relax particularly. In another words, you throw your body. Completely relax your body. There should not be any tightness or there should not be any stress in any part of the body. Sit relaxed mentally and physically. Now begin breathing deeply. With both the nostrils, you have to inhale and exhale. But remember, we have to breathe deeply so that the rate of respiration comes down to 12 to 15. For the second and a half, you have to inhale with both the nostrils. For half a second or three quarter second or maximum one second, you have to hold. Subsequent two seconds, you have to exhale. And taking rest for a second or three quarter of a second, you have to repeat cycle. When I inhale, my belly should come out gradually and steadily. And when I exhale, my belly should go inward steadily and gradually. I hope your rhythm is set. I am inhaling for a second and a half. I am holding the breath for a second. Subsequent two seconds, I am exhaling, taking rest for a second, fraction of a second, I am repeating my cycle. My rhythm is set. Now I am withdrawing 
my mind from all the sides, from all the subjects, from all the objects, and I am fully focusing on my breathing. My attention is on my breathing. With trusteeship, I am observing my breathing. Yes, there is the inspiration, there is the expiration going on. My mind is stable now. My mind is with full, fully focused and concentrated. I am experiencing peace and stability of my mind. Enhance your concentration and try to sense that inward and outward flow of your breath on the inner walls of your nostrils during inspiration and expiration. Yes, I am experiencing the inward and outward flow of my breath during inspiration and expiration on the inner walls of my nostrils. My mind is stable. My mind is fully focused, fully concentrated. Now I am enhancing my concentration still further. The air which I am breathing in is cold. The air which I am breathing out is warm. And I am easily able to sense the coldness of the air during inspiration and warmness of the air during expiration. My mind is fully focused. My mind is fully stable. I am experiencing sweet silence, immense peace. Inhale deeply and let us utter. Oh. Once again, inhale. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Let there prevail peace all around. Let there prevail peace all around. Thanks for, thanks to all of you. Thanks for your participation.